I wanted to um, shape this discussion in a way. You wanna, I, mean, I don't know where you want to stand. <laughs> Um, shape this discussion in a way that it's really not uh, entirely about video recommendations, but about any type of business that provides a personalized experience and recommends assets to, to the audience. So first I'm going to talk about something about, I call a personalization response curve. And this is, what is the value of personalization? What does it do? Is, is an experience that someone has online more valuable than one in which there is no personalization. I'll introduce a few definitions because I think we're all from different industries and perhaps we're often referring to the same things using different terminology. So I'll introduce the way that we refer to some of these. Uh, then I'll talk about the data science team, which I lead, and then Joel will talk about the engineering team. So first I wanted to start off the discussion with a looking at the relationship between personalization and value. Well, what is value? Well, it depends on what you're, what you're trying to measure. What are you trying to do in your business? Are you trying to maximize the engagement time, the number of repeat uh, uh, returning visitors? Are you looking at the number of videos, the number of ads? Whatever that may be that you're showing to your online users, there might be some relationship between personalization. Does anyone have any thoughts on what that might look like? And I hope it doesn't look like this. Because if it does, we're all out of a job. <laughs> but I'm thinking it might look something more like this, where there's some increasing gains. It's a, a strictly increasing where the, the more you personalize, the more value you add to your, to your business. There's also the possibility that there's something else. And in fact, as we start looking at the data, we are not we are, our hypothesis is that it is increasing, but we're finding that it's not a linear relationship. And in fact, there are diminishing returns that the, at some point in the personalization, additional uh, resources that are expended on increasing personalization have less value than they did earlier. So I think it looks like this. Originally, there is a little bit of burn-in period where you start to understand your audience. In the, in the assets that you're trying to, to, uh, to uh, recommend. Then there's a big jump, perhaps, and then it starts to taper off. And that's where you start to get the diminishing returns. The real question here for us is now what happens? What do you think happens here? It could continue to rise, but that's unlikely because people, you know, there are, there's only so many assets one can show you. Uh, there are perhaps limits on the amount of time that someone will engage your site. We may hit something called what I call stabilization, where it just flattens out. There are no further increases in value based on increased personalization. And so you know where I'm going next. How about that? Why might that happen? Well, you don't want a recommendation, perhaps, to be too deeply in your head. It starts to turn people off. And secondly, I think people like serendipity. They like to discover new things. Sometimes they get surprised on, their, on the site. And I think what may happen is at some point it may start to fall off. So what we're trying to do here at IRIS, and, and hopefully a lot of people in the machine learning and data science world, is to understand this relationship, empirically measure it, and also figure out how we might better increase personalization up until the point where the return on investment is no longer positive, that the, that the resources expended on increased personalization add to no more value. So let me uh, talk a little bit about the definitions. I'm going to talk about something called an asset. That's an asset is something that we represent online and that can be consumed. That can be a video, a news article, a book, a car, anything that one can look at online and perhaps then later uh, and then later buy. And the consumption would be the process by one which it, they, 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 they read it, they view it, they eat it, they burn it, whatever they do to it, they somehow consume it. So the process that we look at in, uh, uh, in, in the presentation of personalized recommendations starts with the presentation. This would be the assets that we are, have available on our site for consumption. The user then may or may not select one of them. Then it's delivered to them somehow, either by, by through the screen or through the mail. And then finally they consume it either in part or in whole. What I'm going to call now is something called a track. This is where we may differ. You may call it a playlist, 
a recommendation set. We are calling, Iris calls our list of ordered assets a track. And I'll have a diagram of that that will follow on the next slide to make this a little more clear. And then we have something called an anchor asset. And an anchor asset is the first asset shown in this ordered list. It's sort of what brought you to, that started off the experience. And we use that to first pre-populate if we're looking at a video. You do a search and you're looking for an ice bucket challenge video. You start from there and then we try to build a playlist of related assets based on your selection of the ice bucket challenge video. So here's how it might work. Um, this is our track. This is the continuous play adaptive stream. What would happen here is we have three related Dane Cook videos. Uh, and we'll call that track A. And I'll just call the first one the anchor asset. And then the others are the related ones. And the order does matter. We chose D before F for a reason. Using the hybrid system that we'll be introducing, we're finding what we're doing is on the back end, the machine learning actually constructs the tracks. And then as the user engages the, the, uh, the track, uh, uh, we have dynamic adjustments to that based on how they interact with it. So in this case, if we have the Dane Cook uh, playlist and then one gives a dislike to it, then what will happen is we'll get a reshuffled or updated track that now has the same anchor asset but then continues on with it has different ones. And so what we've done is we've taken the dislike of one of those assets or it could be some other action they took. It could be a like of an asset. They may pause, skip, or jump ahead. But the idea is that we have this hybrid system whereby uh, uh, in a machine learning environment, we build a set of eligible tracks. And then based on the user interactions, we skip to the appropriate track based on the user engagement. And then a user may do an entirely different search. In this case, it's looking for a Louis CK. And so the term we're using for that is those are tracks. Um, uh, each track um, in the various uh, alternatives to that track, beginning with the same anchor asset, we call it experience. And then the overall user session, we're calling an engagement. So what we're doing here is we're taking all of this information that now lets us better understand what's happening. In the machine learning environment, we're capturing all this data. So now we can not only look at the engagements within a track, we can look how people moved across tracks from engagement to engagement, and then how their overall session, uh, what are the similarities among that. So we, 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 log, we log this data, and uh, it's used uh, in our machine learning. And I'll walk through the, how that's done in more detail. But so now let's look, go back to that response curve, which is the personalization versus the uh, something of value. And for value here, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go with the revenue, the average revenue per user. So what I want to do in this presentation, now that you kind of understand how our system, uh, you know, the, just the, the kind of the basic mechanics behind it, is I want to walk you from P0, which is no personalization at all. Figure if you went to YouTube, you just went to YouTube.com and you showed up on the top page, then there's really nothing about that experience that is personalized if I don't know anything about you. I'm going to move you along to P1, P2, P3, and P4, which are increasing ways to, to, uh, to, uh, incre to increase the personalization. And then I'll turn it over to Joel, who will go from P4 to P5, which is that dynamic reaction to a user engagement based on the tracks that were presented using the personalization that uh, we had previously established. So uh, one of, I think, maybe two equations. Uh, I'm not sure who are statisticians here. Basically, uh, what we're trying to do is our entire business is based on a strategy of maximizing some kind of function. In this case, it's value. And I'm going to look at it as a constraint optimization problem because not only am I trying to increase the personalization to increase value, I'm also doing that under constraints. Well, what type of constraints might, might, might one have in a personalized uh, recommendation system? Uh, well, I can't show you assets that I don't own or have the license to show to you. The engagement time of a user may be limited. Um, there may be business rule restrictions that say I can't show you certain content in certain countries or to certain age groups or time of day. These are all constraints we need to operate uh, with uh, operate uh, re recognizing and respecting those constraints. From a data science perspective, these constraints can actually be good because they reduce the, 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 the number of combinations we have to look at for eligible tracks. 
In addition, oh, uh, I should also mention something about the estimation of risk. Um, if you're looking at a measuring an estimate of the value, let's say it's three dollars per user. Uh, well, first of all, I may have many different possible tracks that I can show you that have three dollars per user, but there's some risk associated with it. There's some kind of confidence associated with it. One may be plus and minus three dollars, and another may, may be plus and minus ten cents. So we're not just looking at a point estimate, but some kind of interval. In fact, something that one of my dissertation advisor you know, would always say to me is, a sensible estimate is an interval estimate. And so what we're doing here is we can not only look at things, uh, not just as a point estimate, but how much uncertainty associated with it, and the clients that we serve may have a certain risk profile. There are some that may be very intolerant to risk, and others that are less so. And based on that, we may choose the appropriate tracks for them, given their objective function and the, in the um, uh, constraints that they have uh, told us about. Um, while remaining aware of residual, residual benefits. So you notice that my maximization function has some kind of value. I'll just call it direct revenue right now. Say that's the amount of money we get per, per impression. Per, but we may also look at it from a data science perspective as, as we gather more information, we can use that, in, you can, we can use that, that log data in the interactions with our environment to come up with more precise estimates. And that itself has value which is is less tangible, but certainly something we should consider. And secondly, we can look at the data that we're collecting and perhaps start to draw inferences and correlations that were not, poss that were not um, uh, apparent before and use that information and resell it. So under the cases where I have the opportunity with very little additional cost to increase the residual value, then I'll do so. I'm gonna walk through an example of exactly why I, uh, some cases where we have actually done that. And finally, we need to understand that uh, we have to be able to solve this problem given the available computing environment available to us. Now I should mention that the entire IRIS, all of our decision making, whether this be buying technology, buying software, hardware, the choice of the algorithms we use, how we hire, are all based on this objective function. We try to see exactly what the, what the impact would be on the uh, uh, maximizing this, this function. So what we did to start was without E, we went back and said given that we want to maximize indirect and direct revenue given constraints as a function of personal relation, what is the appropriate technology stack? And Joel will talk to you about the decisions that we have made that will support that. So we use it we based on a strategy of maximizing the revenue rather than a data first. I've uh, too many times seen people that would buy the software and the hardware to handle big data when they don't really understand what, the, what they really need to do with that data. So we first look at it as a what is the strategy and then what are the solutions that will help us manage and analyze the data that results. So how do personalized tracks get constructed? Well there's really two and a half components to it. The first one is we look at the assets themselves and compare them. I showed you a track with three Dan Cook videos. They're similar in that they have similar keywords. They have Dan Cook. They may be of the same length. There are certain features that describe every asset, the metadata, that we can then say they're closer to one another. This one has the same length. It has the same actors. It's the same genre, the same mood. That's the first piece and that is really independent of any user interaction. But as we present the tracks, the users start to engage them and make decisions. They like, they dislike, they skip, they watch things to the end, they, they terminate it early. All of those different uh, bits of information that came from the data I suggested that came from within a track, within an experience, and within an engagement can all be used to update the similarity between the assets. So how does one combine them? Well, if we just take an average of them, Oh, then the, the, the half piece that I talked about with the dynamic, dynamic adjust, adjustment. So we first build uh, tracks based on the first two components after we combine them, and then we do the dynamic, dynamic adjustment. So the similarity between two assets is really a combination of the asset to asset component and the user behavior component. So how do you weight them? Well, we'll talk about that in a, in a little while. So visually, if you look at it, this is 
Anyone recognize this data? Iris. Iris. It's Fisher's Iris data. Um, just as an example, um, this would be the idea is you would have feature, different features that describe each asset, the length, the mood, and so forth. And the idea is we want to build them into some kind of clusters that are similar enough that we present them as a, in the continuous play environment. And the second piece would be looking at historical data. So if I look over here, um, what I'm saying is suppose we had anchor asset one. Um, and in the track, the next one that one presented, the next asset that was shown was, was two, which is here. Can't get this to work, but two. And so I'd say how many assets have I, how many times was asset two presented after asset one? How many people consumed it? What is the, the like to dislike ratio? Who skipped ahead and so forth? And from this information, I would then use this aggregate data, combine it with the original similarity data across the assets to come up with a composite similarity and build clusters. One thing people may note is that because of the addition of the user engagement data, your similarities may not be symmetric. So the similarity between asset I and J may be different than J and I. And the reason for that is the order in which they are presented. This historical data says, the similarity one, two says, given an anchor asset of one followed by two, here's a similarity. If I present them in reverse order, perhaps you would see a different engagement. So, a couple of things we do to, to help um, reduce the size of our data is we first look at the age of the data. It, it, it's, it's our hypothesis that the data that was collected last week is perhaps less valuable than something collected a year ago. And so what we can do is look at some kind of temporal window that says the older the data gets, the less value it has, and so we rate weighted accordingly. What we do in this case is we say, perhaps after some point, after some age, if, it gets, if the observation is older than some value T star, we throw it out. Well, why is that uh, uh, something we, we, can, we should do is, first of all, we're looking at the objective function. We're trying to maximize value by using the most current information, and also looking at the computing environment, which lets us know that we only need to store the data that we're going to use. So how does one determine the appropriate window? Um, well, we can use a little bit of logic. What we're finding in the video space is that the temporal window is a multiple of seven days. And so why is that? Because there's a day of a week effect that is very pronounced in the video world. So if I had a 30-day window, what that means is at least at one point, Every weekday, I'd have four points, and on the weekends, I'd have five. I'd have more data that's more heavily weighted, skewed toward, toward the weekends. If you do it and you logically look at it in seven-day chunks, then that kind of makes sense to the user, and it means that as we're searching for the optimal cutoff point, I've now reduced your search space by seven day, well, from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so forth, to multiples of seven, so now you're looking at one-seventh the amount of computing time. And additionally, the storage of the data, what we do is we have an offline environment, a hive system where we store massive amounts of data. We move data into our, into our local sandbox, this is where machine learning is done, and it only contains the data in a temporal window. Why keep it there if it has no, no value? So we just move it out of the way. So now our computations can be, we, we can do things a little bit faster. There are fewer storage requirements, and the temporal window has somewhat been determined by subject matter expertise. And secondly, by looking at what the appropriate length of the window is in terms of seven-day increments. So here's how that works. We have uh, Iris TV uh, works uh, as an API. Um, the data on the front end is served by MongoDB. Data goes back and forth. But the data that's not really used to support real-time operations um, gets moved aside, the raw log data. And that's a huge amount of information. Every Every action taken by a user, every track, every presentation, engagement, and, and, uh, and uh, experience are stored in there. So what we do is we use aggregation queries we run on Hive and drop them into MySQL, which is our sandbox. 
So why not just directly import them into some other type of system? Like, cause I, I use R. R is everything is done in R with the using the R MySQL package. Well, why don't I just read them directly from Hive? And the reason is because we also have a business intelligence product that that um, operates off of MySQL. So what we do is we reduce the data, move things out of the way, and only look at the summary data rather than the raw data. So um, what I'm storing in MySQL is aggregations of data in, in Hive. So what is a data science, what are the skill sets, and uh, some of the other uh, characteristics of a data scientist at IRSTV? Um, he or she programs in R, understands MySQL, some familiarity, f familiarity with some of these that work with large sets, and just the ability to move data across the different systems that we use. Where we're different from a lot of data science teams is, the differentiator is, that we're looking primarily for people whose background is, is in statistics rather than data management. Those people who understand how to reduce the dimensions of data to make it more compact and to save on storage. And all of the choices that they make, again, are driven by the objective function. So when a, a, a data scientist looks and says, which software am I going to use? Which uh, method within the algorithm am I going to use? For example, in, in clustering, you can use k-means. You can use a nearest neighbor, all these things. Which one should I use? Well, if you look at the objective functions, a lot of time it becomes almost obvious which one it is. And that helps shape the decisions. And I'll give you an example of that. Let's look at just a very simple uh, visual depiction of how clusters of tracks would be built. Here I have an anchor asset of A. I've drawn this circle around there to sort of give you an idea about distance. And if I want to build a, a track uh, having the anchor asset and two more, what two would be chosen? Um, the answer is it depends on the method you look at, that you used. If you use a single link method, if anyone you're familiar with that, it would basically say, well, B is the closest thing to A, and then C is the closest thing to either B or A, which have already been sort of put in the same cluster. If I looked at the two nearest neighbors, it would be E and B. And if I looked at a third approach, which is the complete method, which says, not only do I need to be similar to one of the other assets in the track, I have to be similar to all of them. So the statistician at, at, at IRIS would look at this and say, understand the pros and cons of each one and say which objective function, what, what am I trying to do with the objective function, and then it will become obvious. I think if one were trying to uh, maximize engagement time, that the single link might be the most appropriate one. Because what that would say is your track would go from A to B, and then from B to C, it says that the third asset in the track is more related to the one you just looked at than the anchor. It's sort of walking one along a path. Versus if you want really tight clusters, then you would use the complete method. In, in fact, uh, in a lot of cases, that is, that is what we do because the statistician would know that sort of leads to fewer computations because originally I can look at my similarity matrix and throw out those observations that, um, that have extremely large similarity values, I mean, extremely small similarity values. Whereas in the single link case, I really can't do that because I need to look at all possible combinations. So I couldn't throw out, I can't just compare A to C. I'd have to look at different combinations and paths. It's just a, a more computationally costly thing to do. So when we're looking at the environment, we say, what is the most appropriate method for the, uh, for the objective function? And that is the, the obvious choice that, that one would, would use. So that's what a data scientist, the type of decisions they would make, but of course guided by the, by the objective function. So now a little bit into the nitty gritty of the similarities. Um, so I mentioned before we had, uh, if you're looking at the similarities which are a composite of the comparison of the metadata associated with each asset and the, uh, and the historical engagement data, I'm gonna focus on the asset to asset comparison. So what we do is you look at a weighted sum of the different similarities across the different features. So I would say um, how similar are two features in terms of length, in terms of mood, in terms of uh, keyword overlap, genre, and other things I'm looking at, and somehow weight those. And that's how I'd come up with the similarity. Well, a couple of things we do to make it a little more efficient is we first scale the feature level similarities over zero, one. And if anyone is familiar with uh, clustering, one of the reasons that we do this is clusters are based on the similarities 
among a group of assets. And the similarities are invariant to translation. So I have these similarities, this cluster of points. I move them over here, and the similarities are unchanged. They're also invariant to translation. I can spin it in any direction I want, and the similarities are unchanged. But scale matters. Let's say if one of the features is a time or a distance per time, miles per hour, kilometers per hour, furlongs per fortnight. These are all three different ways that one might measure, measure um, distance uh, per unit of time. And the choice of that would stretch and squeeze the space that you're, you're computing clusters over and perhaps change your clustering outcome. So what we do is we get rid of the units of measure and everything is on zero, one. Uh, about two slides back, you said you were going to solve it. What is the value of W? It was never explained. Oh, uh, next slide. <laughs> I mean, this, this kind of curly W? Yes. Yep, I'll get to that. And really what it is, um, is we somehow need to combine the two pieces of the similarity. And so you put some weight on the first piece and some weight on the second. And it's just an average. And it would say that if you put all of the weight on just the first one, that would be w is equal to 1. Um, all the way to the second one, w is equal to 0. Or if they're both 0.5, it's sort of just an average, straight average. OK? So after we've rescaled, um, what we next do is we look at those weights. And what I do there is I constrain the weights to be non-negative and sum to 1. Well, why do I do that? Well, the search space is, is reduced by one dimension, first of all. But secondly, those weights now, since they now can be interpreted as sort of the relative contribution of each of the features to the similarity, now I can, I can, I can look at it and say this one is more important than that one. And what I can also do is I can look at those values of the weights over time and make business intelligence decisions. The engagement length is becoming more important to these set of users. And I saw this recently, um, a story came out just a few days ago about some of the people who are looking at videos on Facebook are finding that the autoplay function tends to be burning a lot of bandwidth and you know, causing them you know, additional costs. And that would be something that would start to maybe shift people's focus on uh, that they find that the engagement length is more important than some of the other features like mood or genre. So what we do is we come up with a set of weights to build a composite similarity, and then we classify and say, if we had built these tracks, what would the expected value be? And you can look at the historical engagement data that says, I presented this track. I would have I estimated I present this track, and I did present this track and had some value. I also may look at it and say, I presented um, a track in which people liked or disliked. Really, the feedback that one gets in the log data allows us to build a training set that says, here's how people reacted to various tracks. And from that, we build uh, something that we try to minimize the misclassification cost. Some of the more advanced things that we do at uh, Iris TV related to this uh, feature extraction, I'll call it, is we do something called simulated annealing. If you're looking to maximize or minimize an objective function, it's possible you get trapped in a local minimum. And the simulated annealing just says you're not always moving in a direction, you're not always climbing downhill or uphill. You may actually find some set of weights that lead you in a different direction. And you allow it to explore that and just sort of see if, you've, if you're trapped in a local valley rather than a global one or peak. Uh, we also do something called simplex marching. That constraint that all of the weights sum to one is essentially exploring. Uh, it's a simplex, which is a high dimensional tetrahedron, if anyone knows geometry. Basically, you're marching along the surface of that. So rather than looking on the interior of it, you're searching along the surface of the simplex, which, which is constrained to mean that all of the, sums, uh, the sum of the weights is equal to one. What we do is, that could be in, in large dimensions, the search space could be huge. So where do you start? Well, let's just use something that's available to, that everyone's probably familiar with, like a classification tree. We just find out, we try to classify based on the known features and see what splits are made by a, a greedy algorithm like the tree and say, oh, it's split on these features. Why don't we, I sort of start my search there. So it gives us a way, an a priori uh, starting point based on some other method that is not ideal for what we're doing, but does give us some information that informs our starting point. I also look at something called the parsimony penalty. And what I'm looking at there is if I have, let's say, five features and I'm looking to weight them, I prefer cases where 
some of those weights are zero. So if I can classify with four variables as well as I can with a five, I'm going to take the four. And why? Well, I don't have to collect, store, or impute and look for missing value in that data. It doesn't matter if I use it or not. I can do just as well without it. And finally, the loss values that we, uh, that we use are driven by the objective function. And what I'm saying there is a loss would say, if I try to classify something, a false positive uh, versus a false negative. So I would say I have a, a, an asset that I recommended in a track but w wasn't, really, wasn't really popular uh, versus a false negative, which would be I should have shown this, but I didn't. Well, the way I look at it, they have different losses associated with it. I'd much rather show something that wasn't popular because I can collect data on that experience. If there's something I don't show, I don't have any data on it. So in that sense, if we're going to make a mistake, we, we tend to prefer something that you make the mistake in terms of something that allows you to collect additional data. So back to the question, Ty, that, yes, here we go. Um, how do you determine the, that weight and what does it mean? It just means how much does the asset level similarity matter versus the user experience? Well, in the la in, in, if you don't have any user experience data, then W is equal to 1. You have to go with the assets and you start there. And as more information becomes available about the user, you may start to find that the weight of W falls and you start putting more information on the, putting more weight on the second component. That is done exactly in the same way as we did the internal feature weights. We look at different values of, of that weight and try to find out which combination best predicts what actually happened in a way that increases revenue or value. So now let's talk about grouping, stratification, partitioning classes or groups. As a statistician, those are all terms that I used extensively and got sort of a glazed look from a lot of my colleagues. And every time I describe it, they mean, you can like kind of putting things in buckets. I said, yeah, all right, so I call them buckets. <laughs> so what we, what we try to do here is once we've built those weights, now it turns out that not all, all users are the same and that particular groups of users may have individual preferences. There are some users, if you're buying a washer and dryer, some that are more price sensitive versus energy efficiency sensitive. And so what we then do is we try to first partition the data into different groups. And each one of those groups gets a separate set of weights and likely a different set of tracks. So here's an example of, if you have the whole world, and I'm talking about baseball here. You break it into some of these continents. It turns out that in South America, there may be a distinct behavioral difference between Brazil and not Brazil within South America. In North America, you may now have these fans. Anyone knows baseball? We have Red Sox fans. We have Yankee fans. Um, <laughs> we have other fans. And we have non-human users, which I would call bots. Right? So what I want to do is first I want to take the individual user, uh, uh, the entire population of users and put them into di different buckets and then every one of the buckets gets a different presentation set of tracks based on what their individual preferences are. And then they get updated based on their individual interactions. So it starts off with a how we're building the personalization is first of all we know your anchor asset, we kind of know what brought you to the site, we start to learn a little bit about you. Now we're starting to see how you've engaged the site so we know what your preferences are. And we also know what your preferences are sort of in your individual group, which is more refined than, than looking at all. Yes? Isn't that just another feature? Um, what was the question? Uh, why isn't that just another feature? Um, yeah, I, you could look at it as another feature. What, or, but in that, yeah, that's, that's a, a different way of looking at it. I, I agree. Okay. We're doing the, uh, the classification, so each of the, um, so now we have buckets. Um, and I'll have to get back to you, I've got to think more about that. Um, so let's look at just the, the bottom row there, now we broke it. What you'll notice is that the way that we split each 
continent is different. Some we just find that the people in Europe all behave the same in Asia and so forth, but we're now looking at the USA and finding that there are significant differences in the types of fans. And I set this up perfect, pur purposely for the, uh, the next slide, which is when we're looking at the information we're collecting, we do have problems. Not all historical log data we're collecting is the same. Um, this also helps us with something we call a cold start, um, is why when I do partition this, it's based on ge geographically. If I know nothing about you, you're the first time on this site, you've chosen an anchor asset, and I do know where you came from because you have IP. And I can use that at least to start off with some kind of recommendation that say, all right, let me give you the Brazil and not Brazil. Later on, as I learn more, I may put you in a different bucket. I may start to learn that you're a Red Sox or Yankees fan. But the problem with the data is um, there are um, some data that the influence is large or, non or, or, or not uh, insignificant. And we want to downweight that based on some additional information um, that we, we essentially we're looking at templates and saying, what would a non-human behavior, a non-human user look like? And if you fall into that group, we'd say, well, we don't really want to use your, your feedback because you're not, it's not personalized, it's just, just a robot. So what we do is, we have one case where we had one user who selected 1,600 videos in 10 minutes. That's probably not a human. I don't even think that's possible. So what we do is we say, we'll, we'll throw you out. We'll throw out those observations and not use them in, in the filtering. And when the, uh, that user comes back, they get the bot recommendations, which are probably just random. But what we find a lot, uh, Iris does a lot in news and sports and entertainment, we find very polarizing topics that sometimes lead to uh, like and dislike actions that can't be trusted. And this isn't just in the video space. If you look at an example of, you go on Amazon, it says, I loved the new um, baby carriage you sent me, but it took forever to get here. One star. Like this, uh, like this video if you support Obamacare. Right? These are things that are not really the like, are, really have less to do about the video than they do about one's convictions or something else, including the delivery. Where we find it is a problem is, uh, in the sports is here. <laughs> um, I'm a Red Sox fan. If I see a video about the Red Sox making an error, then, then I dislike it. And Joel likes it. And so what we try to do in that case, using, with, with having a lot of sports data, what we then do is, so how do, you, how do you clean that up? Well, you have some kind of null hypothesis that one can build about on that behavior that says, the other fans that aren't really polarized to be Yankees or Red Sox fans, let's use them as sort of the, uh, how we determine what the normal unbiased behavior would be. And then you look at the Red Sox and Yankees fans and see if they, if they are very much biased. So what I'm saying is, let's say that they're the Red Sox video by, uh, of the error, all other fans kind of 50-50 go, you know, some like and some dislike. And all of the Red so this Red Sox fan, every time there's something bad that happens to the Red Sox, and every time something good happens to the Red Sox, like that, then what we do is we kind of look for that and try to clean out that data and say perhaps those likes and dislikes are not really talking about the video, they're talking about something else, which would be their, their, their emotion, how the thing was delivered, or just saying people that are looking for likes for, for some other reason. And what we also do is those buckets that we talked about is essentially a fuzzy classification problem. You belong to um, one or more buckets with some probability that sums to one. And for what we do is we choose the one where there's the highest membership. We periodically revisit those buckets and we say, if there are two sub-buckets or you know, splits that um, tend to have similar behavior, we'll merge them back together. If we start to find subpopulations with an existing bucket that behave differently, we'll split them. And so if you look at starting off as having everyone belongs to the same bucket, um, you know, it, as sort of the one end of the spectrum, what could happen is you could start a continual split until every user belongs to its own bucket, which in our definition is sort of the purest personalization that one can have in terms of bucketing. So what we do is we start to look, and once you belong to a bucket, you can move. For example, if some of the uh, information that we use to build a bucket is based on how much the user engages the site, that may change over time, in which case we may put them in a different bucket. 
So this is a process that happens infrequently. Um, so what we're finding is that in terms of Hadoop and some of the other MapReduce things, uh, uh, solutions that are, uh, that are available, we're not quite finding that they fit us. They're, they're really appropriate for us right now because the amount of time that we're spacing in between these updates, um, say a week, and some of these MapReduce solutions allow us to go from a week to six days, but it doesn't matter, it's still within our window. So we are set up to scale to the point where we can, we can start using some of these systems, but right now um, we're finding that our, our, our Linux system, uh, just using a couple nodes, is appropriate. So, so far I've taken you, I've marched you along the personalization axis, where originally I started off knowing nothing about you. You didn't specify an anchor asset, and then I started to say, well, you've, I've now looked at your anchor asset and looked at the similarities, build tracks based on that. I started to use the historical engagement data, so now my similarities reflect users, interactions. I've now also put you in buckets, and then I improved the buckets. And the idea is that we're hoping that you're moving and marching along the personalization curve. The, re, the uh, reaction that it has along the vertical axis is still to be determined. We are finding definitely so far an increase of about uh, 40 to 50 percent lift in, um, in some of our um, engage, uh, number of videos viewed, if that's what we're using as a value. So I'm, uh, now that I've brought you, I sort of told you how the back end works and what a statistician and data scientist does and some of the tools we use, I'm going to turn it over to Joel, who's going to talk about everything else, natural language processing, um, dynamic track adjustment, and uh, our technology stack. A YouTube aggregation type site, and we had curators in a room manually going through YouTube videos and adding data to videos and choosing videos and simulating different experiences. And I saw a lot of potential in that product because when I went to the YouTube site and other video sites at the time, it wasn't the traditional linear TV experience that is still very, very popular. And I'd had a lot of experience in, in television and in app development and also in machine learning. And I saw a way that these three things could come together and build the next generation of television. Uh, that was about four years ago. And since then, we've turned uh, this Jukebox Television product into an API, which is completely a service-oriented architecture. So it was originally a monolithic app, and we took out the parts that we, we saw that were useful for our clients, and we integrated with the major uh, online video players, and we added JavaScript listeners into these players, and were able to gauge this real-time feedback based on how users are interacting. And all of that combines with all the data science that Tom's group does, and we're able to create these real-time personal experiences for each of the users. And we consider doing star system, we consider different types of uh, preferential feedback. We've done a lot with this, these thumbs up and thumbs down, skip forward and skip back. There's a number of other um, feedback systems that we use. Uh, a lot of our technology is white labeled and because of the service oriented architecture we're able to add in different features and different business rules and almost every day clients come to us with creative ideas for business rules and we're able to integrate them into this existing architecture. So I spoke a little bit about that. Um, one of the biggest challenges at Iris TV is that we work with lots of different content and we are getting in new assets every day from all different sources and we're bringing them together. So we were able to use our background in this manual cur curation as a learning set in order to use machine learning in order to, as, as a training set, in order to train the system to both tag assets that don't have the metadata that we need and to recommend viable tracks for the users. Um, a lot of what we do is we bring assets in the system that have all different schemas and we have mapping technology that we've developed in our workflow to bring these into the, our existing data structures. Uh, we use a lot of natural language processing in order to do that. In addition to the mapping, um, we're able to take assets that have keywords, assets that have transcripts, assets that have all different type of data and bring that into our existing system. Uh, 
A big factor, which I was pretty excited about, was that we were able to use the, um, use the architecture here. Here's a little bit of the service-oriented architecture. So we have this online rec system, and we're able to actually do a lot of the learning and a lot of the personalization in real time as the users um, interact with the video, which we weren't sure if we are going to be able to do, but we are able to do that. And we're caching a lot of the data structures and doing a lot of prediction helps with that. We've been using the MongoDB system for years now, and we were able to really take advantage of the horizontal scalability of the system, as well as the horizontal scalability of the API and the online rec system. A uh, big challenge was integrating all these systems together and minimiz minimizing latency in between them. Um, that has been helped a lot by the caching. And the exciting part is, as we get more and more data into the system, the tracks that we're able to predict for the users have become better and better because of the work that Tom's group has done, and we're able to continually improve the experience and really create a real lean back viewing experience for the users that's similar to what a TV network can provide without requiring the full infrastructure. I used to work at a TV network, and we had a huge room filled with all sorts of broadcast system broadcast system, we had floors and floors of people doing manual research, looking at competing networks, looking at competing schedules, and I had a dream that one day we'd be able to control all of that right from a laptop, and today we really can do that. I mean, we have virtualized servers, server farms, but really all the control can be done in a laptop in an office. That's about it. Any questions? <laughs> is it uh, based on public cloud? Yes, yes, we're using public cloud currently. We, we've been able to accommodate uh, very large scale because we don't serve the video assets themselves. We just, we're basically just passing JSON back and forth. We've been able to horizontally scale everything using public cloud infrastructure thus far. Yes? If you're not controlling, if you don't own the video assets, Mm -hmm. How does that skip forward or backward help? You don't know what happens in that second. So how do you, do you have any embedded attributes at every second of the video so it tells you somebody skipped here because it says something sad or vulgar? Or how do you rate that? How do you know why somebody skipped forward? Well, Repeat the question. The, the question is, it, since we don't own, own the video content, how do we know in real time when a user skips, where they skipped in the asset, what was going on in that asset, and how are we able to make uh, metadata type decisions during the asset? The answer to that question is we are, we are a business that works with clients. So clients come to us and we're gonna be rolling out soon an automated system where you can sign up and have your own, un, own videos and kind of in, input your feeds. We have that um, prototyped already. Uh, currently, there's an onboarding process, which for most of the online video players is very quick, less than a day. During that time, we ingest existing metadata on the videos, including links to the video assets, and we, that's where we run the mapping processes, the natural language processing, the video data extraction and mapping of the metadata, including time data, so that we know where a user skips in the video and we are able to make decisions based on that. So um, I'm curious to see how you actually define the different buckets. Um, the way I start to see a bucket is to say, okay, one person really likes a cat video or something, and another person likes uh, lots of different other types of music video. Is that how you define a bucket? Uh, well, well, what we would do is um, we would take an exi starting off with one bucket, which is everyone. And what we do is we try to say, are, is the behavior of, are there subgroups of behavior that are distinctly different? And distinctly different in such a way that their weights associated with their feature similarities are different. And if so, we construct a bucket. We split them into two pieces. Right? So it's, it's based on um, s continually splitting the, the um, existing buckets in a way that the weights that are generated are have some 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 difference between them.
Right, right, yeah. Right, yep, yeah. so yeah, exactly. So what we do is, is the similarities themselves, we, uh, what, what we do is we look at the value that those similarities would have generated. So, so we're translating, so yeah, it is, it is looking at the, the, uh, the end difference is looking at would this split resulted in a higher value? Driven, it, it, the intermediate part would be the similarities, yes. Yes, hello. Um, how, how much do you still rely on human curation? And, uh, you know, because when you think about Netflix mm -hmm. have, hiring a lot of people to uh, categorize different aspects, different uh, um, mm -hmm. shades of all their movies, or, or maybe a human would be perhaps more efficient in saying, oh, this video has to link with this video. Do mm -hmm. you still do that? We do offer it as a premium service. Uh, some of our clients will bring us metadata um, that is usable. Sometimes we have different confidence levels of different metadata and we're able to combine it together. We do currently use mainly learning in order to uh, extract the metadata for the recommendations. Yeah, uh, sorry to mention the question, but is that more for a computational simplicity rather than doing something more on the personal level like a collaborative book doing? Uh, because you get a lot more personal with each of the, the way in which the individual characteristics of each person, or instead of blocking into to multiple groups based on that. So, so you're asking, are we, uh, rather than a bucket per person, why we put many people in one bucket? Is that? Yeah, because there's an album that was like, how to put in various classes of albums mm -hmm. you can do on a personal level, rather than bucketing into larger genetic groups. I'm right. just wondering if it's a computational thing, like, uh, well, it's really, I think, driven by the uh, hybrid system that we have, is that if we had a set of tracks and variants of those tracks for every user, um, that would be a huge amount of computational storage. So what we do is we sort of start you off with the same as everyone in your bucket, and then your individual decisions uh, take you in a different direction. AV thing, yeah. Okay. Right, right. It's a, class, a, a classification problem. It's the agglometer versus divisive, yep. mm -hmm. right? And, and, and one, uh, we had to pick one, and we, 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 chose, we chose divisive. Okay. And so what we start off is because in the absence of any information, um, I think that makes more sense than looking at each individual, okay. is you say everyone behaves the same until told otherwise. And do you have any uh, non fact based information to uh, the formulation? 
any... Well, uh, there, there are privacy issues associated with that. And, and so uh, all of our users are anonymous. And so really what we have is we know it's the same user that came back and what their engagement history is, but, but nothing else. The, it, it, all of that information, like the Red Sox Yankees, would have to be inferred. Uh, what is he in the sense of, as uh, the problem of sophistication in, in the model builds, uh, what are your infrastructure costs in terms of... Uh, what are our costs? Right, so, uh, so we're a plug-in for uh, all the big existing video players. So we, it's very important to minimize latency and to take advantage of the, the life cycle of a viewing experience. So we... We take user choice as our first piece of information. So you ask, are we coming completely cold? Well, we're not coming in completely cold because we ask a user to make some decision to begin the experience. Um, we also support registration model. Um, as, as Tom mentioned, there are privacy issues associated with that, so there's a bunch of permissions that have to be done on the client side in order to enable that. Um, if we have existing preferences that that users have explicitly said, okay, I want to watch types of video X, Y, and Z. That allows us to you know, have a lot of information to get into the system. And then that first video that they choose, we take that, you know, there's, there's a, a decay based on, on the value of information. So the, the existing experience, if a user says, okay, you know, I want to watch, you know, with the sports example, they're gonna, they're gonna like, they're gonna thumbs up a play that they saw from the, the game tonight and next week they might not care about that at all. So to use the metadata associated with that could be extremely misleading. Um, we, we try to be, you know, our, our goal is to be seamlessly integrated into the video playing experience. So we have computation time in between when the videos are playing um, and we the goal is that the, the client doesn't even know that we're there. The minimum, the latency is such that it does. It's a seamless integration with the with the players. Okay, one more question. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, so you talk a little bit about how you use natural language processing. Sure. So we we have these these data structures that that we've created from our creative team who are experts in sports, music, television, movies, and we analyze uh, language data on assets that are incoming, and we use that in our, in our mapping technology uh, to work with our existing proprietary data sets um, that are used as a factor in measuring similarity between the assets and then updating similarity in the experience. Uh, we also do um, a natural language processing techniques to improve metadata that's that's poor, and we have you know s systems of stop words. And Tom has a whole other right. So that would well. be uh, one example. Would be the um, the word stemming, I guess, is what it's called. So you could have different parts of speech that are really refer to the same thing, uh, and then maybe you could talk about the word like train, or uh, train training trained, those sort of things that really, if they're talking about the same thing. Um, we, we take them back to a base word and then, and then so now you can find more overlap. The problem becomes the train example could also be a, a noun and it could be different types of nouns. It could be a locomotive, it could be the, the, the long part of a dress and those sort of things. So we try to look at it in context and see exactly what, uh, what uh, part of speech they're looking at and we're also looking at stemming back to getting rid of the, 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 the tense that they're talking about. Um, and then additionally, there are um, things out there where allowable for one to explore uh, known uh, named entity recognition, as it's called. If there are a, a list of named entities that are out there in some library, um, then finding uh, proper nouns uh, within our uh, descriptions and titles, one can then match against the uh, existing libraries to give a little bit more uh, confidence. I'll give you one example is, um, uh, it, it can, something I saw that was confusing is you're looking at both automotive and people. There was a person named Crystal Black. In the automotive world, Crystal Black is a color of a vehicle. And so to understand the context in which it's being used, help us better understand 
what, uh, what, what they're talking about when they say crystal black. So we different types of keywords that we use. Um, there's a lot of types of data that's specific to the industries. So we have different data sets for each of the industries that we work with. Um, as we mentioned, sports, news, movies, television. Um, recency is big, duration is big, transcripts, titles, descriptions. That's, there, there's a number of others that are, that are added. Um, those are the main ones. Right, and that, that would be the metadata associated with an individual asset, but the pairwise, the comparisons, um, the, yeah, those, are, those would be stored uh, separately. And so the way it would be set up would be um, um, bucket ID, uh, asset I, asset J, similarity, and then the composite weights and the, um, the two components, how they were weighted. So that one can always recreate that information. But that's how we would store it. And, uh, and what that allows us to do is, as I mentioned, one thing about uh, residual value is now we have the weights that are associated with some bucket. And if it starts to change, now that's our, our, uh, the, the database that we could use to start making business intelligence decisions and see how consumer preferences are changing and, uh, and resell that information. So it's really a, as compact as possible, uh, a way that stores not as a matrix but as a table that has the I and J pairs. All right, let's thank our speakers.